Welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. Today is April 18th, 2019. It's Monday, Thursday. Uh, this is a 6.30 service. And the sermon will be on the Golden Rule. St. John's is located at 27 North Wittenberg Avenue, Springfield, Ohio. Our telephone number is 937-323-7508. St. John's has a food pantry open Wednesdays, 9 to 1045. An outreach store open Monday through Friday, 930 to 1, closed on Thursday. Rainbow table is every Friday from noon to 1. Everyone is welcome to share a meal. Tomorrow, the 19th of April is Good Friday. We have services at 1.30 and 6.30. Sunday, Easter Sunday, services are at 8 and 10.30. There'll be a breakfast served between the two. Through his actions, Jesus teaches us to do unto others as he has done to us. Wash feet, forgive, love. Do unto others as Jesus has done unto you. For this is his perfect will.
it is the golden rule. Most merciful God, in our sinful thoughts, words, and actions, the golden rule turns to rust. We love ourselves more than we love others. We serve ourselves before we serve others. We love and serve ourselves before we love and serve you, our loving God. We deserve your punishment now and forever. But you have sent your only Son who lived out the golden rule for our sake. Jesus loved and served us perfectly through his sinful life and his death on the cross. We beg for your mercy and ask for your forgiveness. On the night of his betrayal, Jesus demonstrated his love and service by washing the feet of his disciples. It was one small token of a life of service lived out for us for us and all people. Because he lived a perfect life and died the death we deserve, we are free. For the sake of Jesus, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.
peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The golden rule seems simple enough. Treat others as you would like to be treated. Or as Jesus says, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Those are the words he taught in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, I'm sure you're aware that Jesus did not call us the golden rule when he was teaching it to those gathered at the Sermon on the Mount. Over time, however, people saw this saying as perhaps the highest of ethical principles and thus attached to it the term the golden rule. The rule makes us pause before an ethical decision and acts. What I am about to do or say, is this something I would like done or said to me? There is no question that such a pause before we decide to act can be helpful. Too often, however, we just act and then figure out the ethics of our decision once we find ourselves in a terrible mess. Or we could be like some people today who just speak or act and never deal with the ethics involved. I believe that is what is referred to as amoral behavior. The whole matter can become very complicated when trying to live the golden rule. Take, for instance, a conversation from a classic Honeymooners TV series in which Ralph and his neighbor Norton are sitting down for supper to eat and the following conversation took place. Ralph began by saying, when she put two potatoes on the table, one big one and one small one, you immediately took the big one without, without asking me what I want. Norton replies, well, what would you have done? I would have taken a small one. You would? Yes, I would. Then what are you complaining about? You got the small one. The golden rule can be sometimes difficult to put into place or even see where it is necessary. The golden rule, in some way, shape, or form, can be found in almost all the religions of the world. We find it in the Jewish Talmud. We find it in Confucianism. Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, and even in the old pagan Roman and Greek philosophers had some type of golden rule. But they said it differently than Jesus. Instead of saying, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, they would say, do not do to others what you don't want them to do. Now there's a difference there. You might have picked up one. One is a positive instruction. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The other is a negative. Don't do anything to anybody that you don't want done to yourself. So one is emphasizing being kind to others. The other is emphasizing protecting yourself by not doing something you don't want that to The negative version is often referred to as the silver rule because it instructs us what not to do. Don't do this. If you don't want the same thing done to you, it counsels us. The Jesus version, on the other hand, has us looking at positive action. Not of what is forbidden, but what must be done out of love for the living. 
Jesus says that this golden rule is the law and the prophets. As he said the golden rule, he probably had in mind the command that we love our neighbors as ourselves, which goes all the way back to the 19th chapter of the Leviticus. Leviticus is part of those five first, very first books of the Bible, which to our Jewish friends is known as the Torah, or the law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The Sadducees, from where the high priest came, the party from which the high priest came from, they only believed in those first five books. They didn't believe that the law and the prophets and the wisdom literature were sacred like the Torah was. They looked at the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the way we, as followers of Jesus, look at the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If we could only have one part of our Bible as Christians, the Gospels would be the part that we would say. So Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, this command is given. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Later on in his ministry, Jesus would summarize the moral law with the two great commandments. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. As Jesus does repeatedly in the Sermon on the Mount, he affirms the law and the prophets, and at the same time, he expands their meaning in the life of those who would follow him. On this night, Monday, Thursday, we can affirm the beauty and the power of the golden rule, but we also that Jesus has more for us than the golden rule to guide what we do and say. Mandem. It comes from the Latin word mandatum. It means a mandate or a command. It was on this night in the upper room in Jerusalem that Jesus gave his command to his disciples to love one another as he has loved them. He said in John chapter 13, after he had washed the disciples' feet, after he had instituted the Lord's Supper, after they had eaten, Judas had gone out to make arrangements to betray him, Jesus in the Gospel of John reports all the teachings that are just briefly mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In John 13, 34, 35, Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So what was Jesus saying? We begin by looking at what was this new command? The word new here means distinctive or fresh. In other words, unlike the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus basically was expanding the interpretation of traditional Jewish law and belief, on the night of his betrayal, now he is giving a distinctive and fresh commandment to his disciples, to his church, to you and me. This is not something that anybody else had given the followers up until this time. The word commandment means a decree or a charge to charge somebody with something or an eating. But it also has the meaning of that the edict or whatever stresses the authority over the one who is received. In other words, 
words, Jesus is not requesting that we do this. He is not telling us it would be nice if we thought about doing it. He's not making a suggestion. He is giving us a command. It is marching orders from our Lord Jesus Christ. He expresses his authority over us as the head of the church, as our Lord and Savior, to do this distinctive and fresh action towards one another. The word give means to bestow something on someone or to commit something to them. So Jesus is bestowing this and committing this to every follower of his. To the church and to every individual. That you love one another. Here the word love is what is used most often when talking about Jesus or when Jesus is speaking. It's also a word used by St. Paul a lot. And that means to sacrifice a person. To give your all. To conquer your will. This is Jesus on the cross at Calvary. On that cross, he sacrificed for us all. He sacrificed for the world so that we might have salvation by believing in him. He gave his all. He didn't get part of himself. He didn't give a halfway job. He gave all of himself into our salvation so that we might have victory over sin, death, and the power of death. And he conquered the will. The human part of him that in the garden said, Father, if you may, please let this cup pass from me. But then he overcame that by saying, not my will, but not be done. And so he goes to the cross. A new commandment I give you that you love one another just as I have loved you. Here the phrase and love means to seek the honest good. Now, we hear people all the time talking about wanting to seek what is good. But the problem with human good is that the idea of good can vary depending on your position in life your status, or what you do. An individual could say, well, I want to do this because it's good for me. But they're not considering if it's good for everybody else. Or is it good for the other members of the family? A corporation might say, well, we're going to do this for it's good, for it's good for our corporation. It might be great for the corporation and its stockholders and its employees, but is it good for the rest of the economy, or even more importantly, is it good for the environment? And then we get into the world of politics. We always hear politicians telling us they want to do what's good for us. Is it really what's good for us or good for them? Is it good for our entire country or is it good to keep their party in power? So human good can be good or it can also have selfish reasons behind it and so forth. When Jesus says we are to love as he loved us, that means we are to seek the honest good in everyone and in everything. Then by this all people will know that you are my disciples and you have love for one another. Um, first love means to love those, and this was radical. This is why this is a new, fresh, distinctive teaching. To love those we don't like. That's not the way the Jews love. The Jews saw people had to love fellow Jews. They didn't like the Gentiles. Gentile civilizations thought they only had to love themselves. We see that if you study history. All kinds of cultures had this idea that their culture was superior and everybody else was less than them, and that's why they would wage war, because these were less, a less people. They should be our servants. They should be more. But this is to love those we don't love, both 
in the church and out of the church. Every congregation in America has people, whether it's a large congregation or a small congregation. They're Christians in that congregation who don't like each other. They just don't mix. They just grate on each other's nerves and so like oil and water. They just never will mix. But, even though we might like, not like them, Jesus is saying we still love them. And we still sacrifice them. We still give her all for them if they are in need. And it's the same with the outside. We are not to look at those who are not Christian as infidels or as lessons. But we are to love them and share the love of Christ and Christian actions for them as well. Then Jesus says they will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The word no means to perceive or to distinguish them. You'll be distinguished from others in society by this love that you have. The question today is, in the United States of America, can Christians be distinguished from non-Christians? Or have we allowed the will to fit in and to be popular cause us to act just like non-Christians? So we would be distinguished by our life. Not that we would be better than them. I don't think that we would have an arrogant attitude that we would just be recognized because of the love we show towards each other. Disciples does not mean just a follower of Jesus, but one who follows his rules of conduct. He doesn't come up in the 21st century and say, well, Jesus said that back then, but it doesn't mean that now. How society has changed. Well, society might change, but sin doesn't. Society might change, but Satan doesn't. So a follower of Jesus follows the rules of Jesus. And the term love for one another means a willingness to give what is needed to the other. Does it mean that you just give to those you like or those you are supportive of the means the willingness to give of yourself to any who are in need. So this is where the golden rule takes us in Jesus' teaching up then to his challenging mandate of John 13 that we show this love and action towards others. On Monday Thursday, Jesus goes beyond the golden rule with its focus on the self, asking, well, I want to be treated like that. But his Monday, Thursday mandate asks selflessly, how can I love myself in serving others? See the difference. The golden rule is not bad. I mean, Jesus gave it to us. We do unto others as we have to do unto them, but the emphasis is on the self. What do I want done to me? The mandate on Monday, Thursday is how can I love myself in serving others? Emphasis on serving others in Christ. In case we had a hard time imagining what this might look like in practice, all we have to do is remember. Jesus washing his disciples' feet on that Monday first. He takes the role of a servant. Imagine what it must have been like for those first followers of Jesus to find him on his knees with basin and towel in hand, cleaning their dirty feet. As I've mentioned to you many times before, cleaning people's feet was the most menial of tasks, save for the youngest slave or lowest slave in the household or for the youngest child. And yet here Jesus was doing just that. When her feet were all clean, Jesus says, If I then, Lord, your teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example 
that you also should do just as I have done. For all the beauty and wisdom of the golden rule, Jesus on Monday, Thursday, gives us another ethical measure for what we say and do. Is this an act of genuine Christ-like love that is a word or a work of selfless service? That is the new mandate that comes to us from that person on day first. What we are doing is it an, is it an act of genuine Christ-like love, of selfless service, or are we doing it just to receive praise and recognition? Way early in the Sermon on the Mount, you recall Jesus warned us about that, about doing things in public to receive praise and admiration is warning us that you have already received a reward. Don't expect anything from heaven. You got what you want, that praise and recognition. So Monday, Thursday, he asks us, are we doing an act of genuine Christ-like love in word and work of selfless service? This goes far beyond asking what I want this said or done to me. It asks, is this what Christ would say? Is this what Christ would do? A firefighter was once asked, what would send you into a burning building to risk your life to save others? His response was a golden rule response. He said, if I were in that building, I would want someone to do the same for me. That is the golden rule in action. But this Monday Thursday response takes it a step further to say Christ-like love moves me to self-sacrifice and service for my name. The golden rule motivation is wrong. But look how much higher the Monday Thursday main name is. Christ's life love moves me to serve and sacrifice for my name. Now begins the walk of Jesus from the upper room to Gethsemane, from trial to execution. We have to wonder, did the golden rule cross his mind on the way of sorrows? Perhaps it did. As he was going the way of sorrows, maybe he said to himself, if I were a sinner, I would want someone to do this for me. But more significantly, he did the loving thing. He said the loving thing. He paused for fervent prayer. He found the will of his Father. And then Jesus went willingly to the cross to suffer and die on our behalf so that we might be his own and live under him in his kingdom. Love was his mandate. Those same hands that earlier had washed the disciples' feet would in a few hours be pinned to a cross. We know what love looks like because of Jesus. Amen. Peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds to Christ Jesus. I invite those who came to stand as we offer our petitions to God in prayer. Our response this evening is to our prayer. O lover of souls, you have called us to do unto others as we would want things done unto us. You did it even better. You told us to do unto others as you have done unto us. You washed the, the feet of your disciples. Forgive their sins and love them unconditionally. Live in us and love through us, Lord in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord.
number of souls. You run your church with an evening and a dying love. You speak down to us in word and sacrament to forgive us of our grievous sins. Enable us to love so well that the world sees us not as hypocrites, but as people who live to love and serve. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O lover of souls, you love even through the laws and structure of government. Bring order to our society so that people are free to love and serve you and love and serve their neighbors as themselves. Give your church and your word free course so that nations come to faith in you as Savior. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O lover of souls, you love our physical bodies too. We ask that your will would be done in bringing bodily renewal to those who are ill. We especially ask that you would provide healing to those who are near and dear to us. Where it is needed, use us to provide help and support. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O lover of souls, you love the world so much that you gave your life on the cross. All those who believe in you will not perish but have eternal life. Today we remember our friends and relatives who have believed in you and now live in your heavenly presence. Help us to serve others as they serve us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. In your hands, Lord Jesus, we place all of our needs, knowing that you have served us perfectly even to the point of death. Time for our offering. Cindy Pearson and Becky Dimitrov are collecting. Those who came to see. Let us pray. Bless for you, O oh God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and hope we have gathered in feeding the world with your love. Through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Please turn to page 152 as we continue our celebration with the great next.
Body of our Lord Jesus Christ, with precious blood, strengthen and preserve you in true faith and the life eternal. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, in a wonderful sacrament, you strengthen us with the saving fire of your suffering, death, and resurrection. May the sacrament of your body and blood so work in us that the fruits of your redemption will show forth in the way we live, where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit. One God, now and forever. Amen. The God of all grace, who loves you far more than you love yourself, bless you with every spiritual blessing, as you do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Rejoice and be glad. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We conclude our worship with, O Jesus, blessed Lord, to thee. Monday Thursday service. Join us tomorrow for Good Friday services and then again on Sunday for Easter services. Good night.